All right. Good afternoon to you all listening to me on our various um, social media platforms. We have those following us on YouTube. We have those following us on Facebook, on um, Instagram. We have those f um, following us from all social media platforms of the Jackson Institute of Innovation and Leadership. You are all welcome to Jail Leadership Convo. This is where everything, innovation, and management takes place. And um, I'm excited that we want to have a wonderful session, um, achieving wholesome health. But before we go deeper into what we have this afternoon, um, those following us online, you can just put your program expectations on in the comment session on YouTube, if you are um, streaming from YouTube, you can just put your program expectation there, um, what you want to find out from us, what you want to know, your questions, we are going to address them right from the Jackson Institute of Innovation Leadership. We are going to address all your questions there. Those of us here, um, your questions are massively welcome. We are, but for, for now, we are going to take um, a few expectations. Um, if someone can take my microphone, so we want to have some few interactions. As I already said, we're going to have a very wonderful time and interactive session. So the first thing that we're going to do is that um, we want to know your expectations from, for the program. At the end of the session, at the end of the few time moments we are going to spend here, what do you want to learn? What do you want to get? from this interactive session that we're going to have and from this program. I'm seeing um, the last person on my left, um, Madam Cynthia, the next person. Can we give it to Mr. Collins Adutrum for him to also give us a little bit of something here, um, his expectations, what's, what he's expecting to have from us for this program. So that is what I'm going to do. I'll give the microphone to you. You just tell us something small, not something big, something small. Maybe I want to learn about this. I want to know about this. At the end of the program, I want to know this. It's very important. We want to have a few interactive session. So if anyone is ready, can just put up your hand. You give me a wave. We give the microphone to you. Then we take it from there. Thank you. Can someone help him with this microphone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, boss. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. So, Mr. Collins Adutrum says that he wants to know more about hypertension because of how uh, mortality rate has increased um, due to that disease. So we want to take um, a different person. I'm, I'm seeing Madam Cynthia, if you, would, if you would also want to share with us your expectations for this wonderful training session we are having. We will we'll be grateful. Thank you. Put your hands together for her, please. Okay, so she also wants to um, know how she can be able to achieve a wholesome health. Um, I'm seeing, I think, can we come to the front row? Um, Senior Joe, can you give, it to, give the microphone to him? Senior, we also want to find out from you your expectations for this wonderful training session we are having. Thank you so much. Put your hands together for him. So he also wants um, whatever we are going to learn this afternoon to be very specific. As he rightly said, there is a lot of information out there about wholesome health, but he wants an in-depth knowledge and a, a specific um, information about a wholesome health. Put your hands together for him once again. So I'll be coming to my right. On my right, I have a couple of people that I also want um, to um, ask them about um, program expectations at the end of the day, you know, the person in every program name. So, um, my mom 
on the last seat. Yes, can you give it to her? And please, um, when you take the microphone, you mention your name to us, and then we take it from there. Thank you so much. I'm Evelyn Moferi. Uh, I want to know more about general health and staying healthy. That's why I am. That's amazing. Put your hands together for her. <laughs> Mama Evelyn says that she wants to know more about general health. So those of us who just join us online, um, we are taking some few expectations for this program. Um, since you are also uh, our online participant, all you can do is that you can just put your comment on the, in the comment box and then we will read it aloud for all of us here to also learn from the few things, your expectations and your questions for this wonderful August gathering. Um, on my right, um, I'm seeing, please can you come forward a bit? Yes, so um, the first gentleman on my right, can you give the microphone to him? He will mention his name to us, and then he will let us know what his expectations are for the program. Uh, I'm Robert Trumessi. Good afternoon. I'm Robert Trumessi. Good I afternoon, would, Mr. Robert Trumessi. I would like to know, uh, taking late meals and having less uh, sleep, the effect of these two things. Okay, that's amazing. Put your hands together for him. Yes. So he is also um, interested in knowing more about the consequences of, I mean, having less sleep. You know, sometimes we have a lot of people who um, at night, they, they can't sleep. They're always awake. What are the uh, consequences? And, uh, and then what are some of the um, uh, strategies or practices that he can um, adopt to alleviate such conditions? Put your hands together for him once again. So we'll be taking more um, expectations. Um, my... Yes, my gentleman in the middle, after Prof. So can you give the microphone to him? We want to learn about your expectations for this afternoon's meeting. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Francis Slate. Yeah, I am here to uh, learn more. And then uh, I put into the comment box that I'm having a sleeping disorder and those times. So I'm here to learn more about. What That's I'm amazing. Saying. Put your hands together for him. You know, there is a saying that your health is your wealth. And he said that he, he wants to know more about how he can be able to, I mean, uh, find solutions to any condition regarding sleeping disorder. You know, as um, uh, Brother Robert already said, uh, sometimes people can't sleep, but then he wants to know more about that and solve the problem. So one thing that you, you need to understand about the jail leadership convo is that we come here, that is where all the brighter minds meet. This is where all the innovation converge. And we do not come here just to have interactions. We do not come here just to give you a lecture. The main reason why we are here is because we want to solve problems. So that is why we are here. So at the end of this program, any problem that confronts you, any problem that you need solutions for, we are here to solve all your problems. At my left, extreme left, um, the one with um, the beautiful lady in black with um, a scarf. Yes, can you yeah. speak to us shortly? Okay, Your so expectations. I'm Akosia Pinamai. Akosia My Pinamai. My expectation is to learn more healthy tips at the end of the program. Amazing. Put your hands together for her. Even though I do have follow-up questions on what she just said. She said her expectations, are, her expectations are that she wants to get a lot of healthy tips. Um, let's, let's talk about that. Let's stay on that one. Uh, what are some of the healthy uh, tips that uh, you may want to know? If you would like to um, expatiate on that for me. Penaman, would you like to go further? Okay, that is fine. So, behind Pinaman, there is a fine gentleman there. I would like to also know his program expectations for this afternoon. Hello, I'm Dennis Mensa. Dennis Mensa, thank I you. I want to know um, the relation between food and then sleep. Okay, how food does to the body and then. Okay. Okay, so Dennis also wants to know um, um, the relationship between food and then um, sleeping if I get you right. So that means that um, is there a condition where because of the food you eat, you may not be able to sleep or you may uh, sleep extensively if I get you right. Okay, that is a, a great expectation. And at the end of the session, 
we hope that all those questions and all those challenges and all those solutions you need will be um, answered. Into me, Pastor, ye bani se ya, ye bani se ya. Okay, into ye bani se ya. Yes, the the nice gentleman with spectacles, no Pastor, for Mike and the man on a on candy on on so so person at the end of the program on a the on so so person on your free mo. Me pacho. Me de kwabna amwa. Kwabna amwa. Yeah. Pese ni ni hu di inti a pressure. Eh 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 eh. Eh wo as with this CCI. Okay. Okay. Please put your hands together for him. Me pacho kwabna amwa. And so eja amwa. And so say. O pese un hu di a pressure. A di a pressure. Eh 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 wo nipa nipa duyem. Now, at the end of the day, you know, we no solutions for that. And let's put our hands together for him. That's a great submission. And we know that our abled doctor is going to address all these um, issues. Can you come to my front? Uh, my mom, my grandmother wants to also make a submission there. So. I'm to my makisiedu. Of late, I think the, there is an increase in uh, cases of brought in dead. Uh, died on uh, on arrival or something uh, like that I, I don't know if there is anything that is causing that apart from perhaps the person may not have taken good care hypertension or something of that why the increase in that and then uh, old age you go to hospital and the whatever you report of they ask you uh, did your mother have it uh, is there a case of it in your family something like that what has old age got to do with genetic uh, problems that's amazing put your hands together for my mom okay so you know there have been several cases where people go to the hospital and at the end of the day the doctor will not even be able to make any diagnosis. patient my mom here wants to know why some of these things and according to her um, based on experiences and the ordinary who know cases like that um, they have really increased. I be brave, especially this year. Yeah, year we see more. A lot of people have died, and mostly they don't even die in the house. Oh, yeah, they need a hospital. Me yare me hospital. Me tia me yare me hospital. By the time we do hospital, so we walk around da da So, uh, what are uh, the causes of some of these things? Mom wants to know about what is causing some of these incidences. And then aside that, we be one of us who are we yare hospital. Now, okay, yeah, we are uh, health professionals. Now, it may be so. Say, ah, I didn't say yeah, we will say no. Oh, my, me, I Oh, my, me, Do you have um, um, cases uh, similar to this in your family or in your house? So, she also want to know um, some of the um, diseases um, that are hereditary. So, it's it's a wonderful thing that my mom wants to know. And when we get to know some of these things, we can be able to solve those problems. In this, oh, be our house, and I say, yeah, we be, oh, papa, yeah, be, and I say, yeah, we be, oh, my, me, yeah, be, na. You, uh, there are chances to say, also be to me, inherit this. I are now not right from Omranti Brimona and also Oku and Nimuo, Wunfi Mono. What shall I say? Oh, find new solutions to to that. Said the bear at the end of the day, no, Embers, Yarabia Baba, the bow, Nafi, Intimina Honshe, and I dear two, Mamma, and I dear two, Papa, no, it means so Ababa Baba too. So it's a wonderful uh, expectation that uh, my mother here. Um, um, has so, um, young Koyen in Can we come to the left side? We have nice gentlemen, um, there. Yes, the gentleman who is just smiling. Um, can you please, um, tell us your expectations for this meeting? Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Jose Tutubuachi. Jose Tutubuachi, nice to meet you. Yes, sir. And then, my mine is I'm, I'm more, I'm more like curious, um, to hear what is going to happen today because. From my experience, when I see health programs, maybe you would see that there is maybe a specific topic 
like somebody wanting to know about hi uh, hypertension and maybe let's say cancer and all those things. But then looking at um, your program, I can see achieving wholesome health. There's not a specific target area like what I am used to. So I'm actually very curious as to like, what at all are we come to talk about? So mine is more of a curiosity that I want to satisfy today. That's amazing. Put your hands together for him. So according to him, mostly, so we'll call a health talker. He put on a specific. Oh, yeah, bar for cancer. Yeah, bar for ABR, breast. Yeah, bar for ABR, service cancer, respiratory this. But this one is a general program. You see, achieving wholesome health. And he is very curious. He wants to know what we are going to say this afternoon. And amazing, I'm also very curious. Um, but um, before we even get deeper, or our speaker even speaks to us more about uh, the word wholesome health, now, I want to know, say, apart from the program, yeah, 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 um, wholesome health, you know, why not that? Apart from program, yeah, 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 yeah wholesome health, you know, that word wholesome health, you know, what's it that? You can just give me a wave, and then we can also uh, uh, take it from there. And to say, be a wholesome health, and what's it that? Me the mementi wholesome health that. And to know, say, what's a wholesome health that? You can just uh, give me a wave, and then we can take it from there. Okay. So if um, um, there is no one to um, tell me more about that, I think we are going to go deeper and officially start with the program. And we're going to take an opening prayer from Miss. Akosia Pinaman Che Menu. Put your hands together for her. Please let's kindly rise for a prayer. <clears throat> Almighty God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the gift of life and the opportunity to learn in taking care of our bodies. We pray and commit our speaker into your mighty hands that you grant him the knowledge and wisdom in ways that he's about to educate us more on health. We also pray and commit our loved ones who are on their way coming that you guide and protect them so that they arrive here safely. This and many more we ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Put your hands together for her. And put your hands together for the almighty God for starting this program with us. It is amazing. Um, before our director, our deputy director for the Jackson Institute of Innovation and Leadership um, speaks to us, um, um, IT, I would like you to um, give me a signal. But ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that our guest speaker is in. Oh, you are not excited. I thought you were going to be excited. I want you to know that our guest speaker is in. Can we put our hands together for him? Okay. So, now the program has officially started. Are you ready? So, all the expectations that you shared with us, um, our doc is here, and he is going to address... All of them. All right. So you take a welcome address from Mr. Daniel Jackson. Can you put your hands together for him? Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. It's good to see you. Can you all see me? Hello? Yes, please. We can see you. We can hear you clearly. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank God. Day. I'll, I'll also take this opportunity to um, welcome everybody who has helped to put this together at one uh, we will be live soon on PCG TV who will be carrying this uh, awesome talk all over the country I would, before we do that I would like to introduce the speaker for the occasion, he's uh, a very personal friend, my, my very own. He's the uh, general physician for Jackson Group, 
Uh, he is the family doctor as well for everybody at Jackson. And, and he's a very learned friend as well. So Dr. Nana Kwame Ayisibwati is a family medicine consultant uh, at KNUSD, uh, Kwame Nkrumah University of uh, Science and Technology Hospital. He's also a senior lecturer at the School of Medical Sciences at the same Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. He's a fellow. He is a fellow of the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons and an executive member of the World Organization of Family of Doctors, Wonka. I think he was, he just stepped down as their general secretary. Banco, I think that's true, right? He, he, he's been the general secretary for a year or so. So he just stepped down, but then now he's now an executive member in the Africa region. He's the director of Allen Clinic and so many other businesses I'm sure he doesn't want to talk about here, but then he will give us uh, a snapshot when he's talking. Uh, Alan is a private clinic at Ahinsayan Estates, and that is where all Jackson uh, staff, especially those uh, in Kumasi, we, we fall when we are our bodies are trying to deceive us a little bit. So today we are going to make sure our bodies don't deceive us. So which it focuses on providing comprehensive, Allen Clinic focuses on providing uh, comprehensive, creative and preventive health services to families and corporate organizations. Dr. Aisibwati is, I can't end by not stating this, you know, he's a, he, he likes to learn. He doesn't even want to sleep. I remember when we were, in the in the school now i think has moved from what used to be the school to now the main school so he's an old student of the presbyterian boys secondary school presec legon not not the other ones the legon one he's a christian and he's married with three daughters i think we the presecans and we are of our batch we've all kind of lost our hair due to the water from presec but it is well uh, we thank God for such a time. Uh, Dr. Banco, as I call him, welcome to Jackson Institute of Innovation and Leadership. We have Jackson College of Education, Jackson Institute of Technology, where we provide uh, excellent and quality services in the tertiary field. Welcome. And everybody online, everybody at the premises, we pray that you listen with attentiveness he we will he will give you time to ask him questions. Uh, it's not a consultancy period, so the questions will be more generic. And if you need to see him, uh, he will create time for you at Allen to to go and meet him. So thank you all very much. Let's make uh, let's let's be all ears and listen to Dr. Aisi Boating. You're welcome. Please put yes, your hands sir. together. Put your hands together for director, Mr. Daniel Jackson, one more time. Amazing. So ladies and gentlemen, the moment we've been waiting for is here. And we are going to have a wonderful lecture from Dr. Nana Kwame, a C Boateng. Put your hands together for him. All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. And happy new month. Yeah, actually today on Joy FM, Love FM, I heard that March is supposed to be the Ghana month. So um, when I was coming, I thought of wearing my bow tie like I did the last time. But then when I heard that today marks Ghana month, I was like, then I need to look Ghanaian, right? Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here. I was here last year, and um, this year I was, I've been invited again by my good friend and brother, director of jail um mr daniel jackson and then i'm also very grateful to professor and mrs jackson i'm very grateful i don't take it for granted at all that um you invited me last year to come and talk about medipreneurship and this year you have invited me again to come and talk about wholesome health if you go to a place and they invite you again it means that probably you did something right the first time right um, so I'm, I'm truly grateful. And I also want to acknowledge the fact that the Jackson brand is an excellent brand. It's a brand associated with excellence. So 
Um, if I've been invited to come and speak on this platform, I, am, I know that then I can also associate myself with levels of excellence. So I'm very grateful. I don't take it for granted. Thank you all very much for also making time to join us. Um, we'll be talking about achieving wholesome health. And this is a very important topic. Can I have a pointer? Oh, okay. This is a very important topic. Um, and also in a new year, 2024, as we are in the first quarter of the year, it's important that all of us get to know the, the very ingredients to be able to achieve wholesome health. As my brother mentioned, our health is our wealth. Usually when you walk around and you're able to get up in the morning and do your regular activities, you, you, you tend to think that it's automatic, that when you sleep, you should wake up. That when you sleep and you wake up, you should have strength. That, and I was telling a friend, sometimes we, we, we talk like yesterday. You may have told someone, oh, I'll meet you, Ochna. I'll meet you tomorrow. Or I'll meet you at 12 o'clock. And we never think that that 12 o'clock or the following day, may not come to us, or that we may wake up in the morning and we don't have the strength and the energy to even go on. But we just take it for granted, oh, I'll meet you next week. And sometimes we tend to even postpone a lot of things that we are supposed to take care of, um, thinking that we have all the time. But then it's only when you wake up and then you have a headache, or your tummy is hurting, or you are running diarrhea, or you can't eat, or you can't talk, then you realize that reality is that we are not all supposed, to, it's not automatic that when you wake up in the morning, you should have normal or perfect health. Then w the main purpose of this lecture is that this morning I was interviewed on Love FM, thankfully to mommy and my brother. Um, and then they're asking me, is, is it achievable to have wholesome health? And I said that, yes, it is. It's achievable. It's just that there are a number of people. One, some people do not know what to do to achieve good health or excellent health. Some people, they know. They will start doing the right thing, but then within a few days or some short period, they stop along the line. And so the question is about consistency, right? They, some don't know at all. Some know, they, they start and then they stop. Others too, they start and they never even continue again. So today my objective is to try and share with you essential tips that you can, one, for those of you who don't know at all, get the knowledge. For people who know already and have forgotten, it's going to serve as a reminder. For those who know, they start and are not able to continue, I hope that the things I'm going to share with you will serve as a blueprint that you use to remind yourself every day as to whether you are meeting your health goals or not. So I start my presentation with this picture about a reality check. So you see this elderly man, we don't say old man. You see this elderly man, and then you see a small boy looking into the mirror. And then the old man is telling him that it's only a short trip, enjoy it. Meaning that in actual fact, this elderly man remembers when he was this small boy, okay? And yes, so does he look familiar? He looks familiar, right? Yeah, the pose looks familiar. And you see this, this young boy had a full hair, right? And, <laughs> and now this young boy does not have hair at all. And it's not so long ago. Actually, this was when this young boy was about 12 years old. It's not too long at all. I remember this very well. This is myself when I was 12 years old. And now my hair is gone. Even no matter how hard I try, my hair can't grow. You understand? I'm sure all of you can look back on some of your childhood pictures and then see how much you have changed. So th this should tell all of us that um, there's a period in our lives where we will change from um, being so young and to be not so young. And I'm showing you this slide to remind all of us of our common fate. Okay, this is how the life cycle is. So we all start as babies, we are crawling. 
at, we become toddlers, sometimes preschoolers. We start primary school and there's no worry. Sometimes you can even decide that when you close from school, you don't even learn. Or you don't even do your homework. It's just that the teacher will beat you. We get to that stage. Then you get to the university, you graduate. After the university, you start working. Most of us are within that group. We start working and then we have no worries. All we are thinking about is how we can make money, how we can make an impact, how we can um, develop reputations for ourselves in our profession. And we go on and on and on and it gets to a time where now we are holding our waist and we are holding um, a stick. And then it gets to a time where now you can't even get up anymore. You may be here and say that tofiakwa, like this part, will not happen to you. But trust me, if Christ doesn't come, and then you will live even to be 120 years, 150 years, 200 years, or whatever, a time will come for as long as you are alive and you haven't been raptured. You will get to that point where now you can't walk anymore. So this is the common fate of man. But the first part is assured. The last part is not assured. Some people end by the fourth stage or the fifth stage. Some people end by the last but one stage. But then the question is that, what determines who gets there and at what time? Some people actually jump from being toddlers to being bedridden very early as a result of all sorts of illnesses hitting them or disaster hitting them. Others too, they don't even grow to this end and then they die. But whatever it is, this cycle is the fate of every man. And I, whilst I was preparing these slides, I was reflecting that in terms of wholesome health and everything, you know, for all of us who are here, we are here because we were born at one point in time, right? And there's a statement I made last week which I found quite profound that in actual fact, we were born to die. Okay, all of us here, we were born to die. And it's the common fate of every man that once you are born, you will die. Now it's about when you will die, or how you will die, or the period between your birth and then your death, what will happen between them. We know Kwame Nkrumah. Kwame Nkrumah was born, was it 21st September? It's a holiday that we all commemorate. The same day that Nkrumah was born, other people were born, but nobody even remembers their birthday, right? How about Professor Ivan Sata Mills, the late president? He also died. And then every year, we remember. The day that he died, the whole nation came to a standstill. Do you remember? But trust me, that day when he died, several other people died. So it means that even though all of us have a common fate of being born and dying, whether your life will be of significance depends on what you do with your life. Living a life of what? Wholesomeness. Okay? Making an impact. What are the things that matter to you? Okay, what are the values? What are the lives that you are in, in, impacting? What are the things that you are doing that people remember you? So that if you, you should go at even age 33, Jesus' uh, ministry was just for what, three years, and yet the whole world remembers him. So you can die early, and yet you have significance. So whatever it is, it's between this journey. And then once again, there are people who come to my hospital, I see them, and then they are like, like Prof. Jackson. Prof. Jackson is 79, approaching 80. He comes, he walks into the consulting room himself, looking fit. Meanwhile, his contemporaries, some of them come and they're in wheelchairs. Some cannot even come to the hospital. So the question is that, what can you do such that when you get to the, an, an old age or advanced age, you can still enjoy good health? sound mind, body, and spirit. So the WHO defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So there is health, meaning that health is also defined in three components, physical, mental, and social well-being. And these are the things I'm going to tackle today. And I found this diagram at the WHO website, which looks at wholesomeness. So when you talk about wholesome health, we are looking at those three components being in harmony, having a balance, 
among the three, physical, mental, and social well-being. So you see in the middle, we see in the middle um, the human being where you have the body, mind, and spirit. And then outside that, you have family. We are all born into a family. So how does the body relate to the family? And then you have the psychosocial environment, how you think, how you interact with people, even here, how I'm even talking to you, the people I'm going to meet today. Um, then the physical environment, like the buildings we live in. We have the human biology within yourself. When you, you feel hungry, how, do you, how does your body respond? When you feel thirsty, that's your physical environment. Then your personal behavior, whether you smile or you're always looking serious and no one can even smile back at you, okay? That's all part of your health. And then your lifestyle, the things you do, okay? We'll talk about some of them. And then the community. And your community, you have people around you. You have your immediate community. You have the national community. You have the international community. How do you interact with that community? And around it, you have the culture and biosphere, which is culture is what? The way of life of people. So how do people even define you in terms of your culture? So when you're able to understand this concept and play within that milieu, then we say that you are enjoying wholesome health. Is that okay? So we are going to take them one by one. All right. So how do we achieve wholesome health? I'm going to share with you key ingredients. And this is something I formed several years ago and I've been sharing over and over. It's a mnemonic called new cases. The first one is N. N stands for nutrition. N stands for nutrition. E stands for exercise. W is for weight control or water, water intake. C is for caffeine. A, alcohol. S, smoking. E is for examination. That's regular medical examination. And then the last S has three components, stress, sleep, and then spirituality. We are going to take them one by one. All right. The first one is nutrition. Wow. Is someone hungry? <laughs> Between these two foods, tell me, don't lie, please. Between the food on the left, the fufu on the left, and then these green, yellow, pink, whatever on the right. Which one will you choose? How many of you will choose the left one? I'm one. Aha. How many of you will choose the, the one on the right? That one is like dessert, eh? or you have it as appetizer. Exactly. You see, when we talk about nutrition, keep in mind that it's not so much of not eating, and not so much of not even eating some things. Okay, it's about what you eat, how much you eat it, when you eat it, and how often you eat what you eat. That matters. Okay. So, there's a statement I have there. Yeah. So, be mindful of what you eat, how much of it you eat, when you eat it, and how often you eat it. And another statement I have there is that we, we eat to live. We do not live to eat. So, for those of you, when you have food, you sit down, and then you eat and eat and eat and eat until you do. Yeah. What you are doing is that you are living to eat. You are not eating to live. So what you eat or how much you eat should be tailored towards your level of physical activity or your need for what you are eating. Okay? So if, for instance, you are going to dig trenches, okay, you've been um, hired as a laborer, you are going to t dig a manhole, maybe six feet, then you need to eat the fufu, right? Because you need that energy. But if you are going to finish eating and come and sit here for one night and listen to Dr. Isibuatin, you don't need that food, right? What you need is the one on the right. Because, <laughs> because you will not use that energy. Then again, even if you are going to eat that fufu, it shouldn't be as big as this. So that's where sometimes you will say that take a, 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 a ball of fufu like the, your, your a fist, mm? like your fist, or even half of your fist. <laughs> and then drink a lot of water. But what do you see? For us, we have turned it upside down. So sometimes some of us will wake up in the morning, 
we are going to work and then we even skip breakfast. At lunchtime, maybe we are so busy, we grab a drink and then a snack. And then we get home around 6 p.m., sometimes 7 p.m., 8 p.m. And then there's a heap bowl of what, rice with small stew for us. And then when you finish eating, what do you do? You sit behind the TV and then you fall asleep. So you didn't use the, the food or you didn't use the energy, the calories that you need for the energy or for its intended purpose. So then what will happen is that the food will accumulate and then in no time you start growing big. Your tummy will start growing big and they say that when you're sick, you're through. <laughs> okay. And for men, our tummy will start growing big. For women, sometimes you start developing big hips and then people see and say, oh, why are you full? Aha, not knowing that. Yare, yare gumu, you understand? So we've turned it upside down. Where we are eating, we are eating heavy meals at late hours and then rather eating light meals at, at, at a time when we, we need it. Right. Okay. But then the other thing we should also keep in mind is that exercise is key. And when we exercise, we burn calories. So whatever we take in, we are supposed to utilize it. Do you understand? And some people will say, well, me, I exercise. When you ask them what kind of exercise you do, they say, a juma me will feel create chain exercise. Like the work I do at home is more than exercise. I clean, I scrub, I do this, I do that. But keep in mind that exercise should be intentional. Intentional meaning that you should wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to exercise. Because the additional benefit of exercise beyond burning calories is that you prepare your mind for it. Your body stimulates some hormones that will relax you. Okay? So that the benefit you are getting from the exercise is not just burning calories, but then you are renewing your mind. Remember that mind is part of wholesome health, right? You are renewing your mind. You feel good. For me, some of the times that I feel good is after I've played tennis. Mm? When you feel when you play tennis or you go for a walk, you feel good about it. So it should be intentional. It should be programmed. So you should have a, a plan where you say that, okay, early morning, I'll wake up in the morning and then go for a walk 30 minutes and come back before I bath. It should be something programmed and it should be consistent. So if it's every morning that is convenient for you, you can do it in the morning. If it's after work in the evening that you want to do, you can do it as well. Another thing about exercise is that choose an exercise regime that you enjoy. Not something that is arduous or like heavy for you. So some people, you see people with shoulders, big shoulders and muscles and you say, me too, I want to put on muscles. So I want to go to the gym. When I see people with muscles, I really admire them. I wish I had the same. And I've tried several times. I never succeed. Okay? Because for me, if you take me to the gym and you ask me to carry weight, I'll just do it two, three times, and I feel that, oh, hammy. Like, you are giving me work to do. Okay, so you can, some people can, beginning of the year, they'll go and register at a gym, maybe pay like 500 Ghana cities or 1,000 Ghana cities. They say, I'm going to go to the gym. But because they don't enjoy it, me, if you go and register me gym free of charge, because when I go there, I'll not be able to continue. But if there are some people who like uh, metals, if that is what you want, then it means that when you go to the gym, enroll in the gym, do it. But the cheapest and easiest form of exercise is going for a walk. What do you need? You need your feet and then a road. That's all. Up a crowd in Shempabwa. Do you understand? And I know people who go for a walk without um, wearing anything because it's also part of therapy for the feet. All you have is your two feet. And then, the, the, and then what, the good thing about walking is that if you get up from your house and you walk 30 minutes, say, to a doom, what will happen? You will come home, right? So you definitely walk back. Do you get it? So it helps you. And some people, when they are also feeling um, self-assured, then they go and buy a treadmill. Treadmill, the last time I checked, several years ago, was about 2,000 Ghana cities. I'm sure maybe it's about 7,000 or 5,000 cities. Most people who buy, how much? 15,000, good. They can buy a plot of land, right? <laughs> uh -huh. Most people who buy treadmills, they keep it and it gathers dust. They never get on the treadmill. Because what it is, he gets on 10 minutes, then he says, let me go for water. He drinks water, he sits down. 
then with time, they never get on the treadmill. And it's also not a good investment to do. So as I'm saying, the easiest form of exercise is to go for a walk. Or like in this picture, you can decide to jog. Because when you do that, you'll be helping your heart, you'll be burning calories. But importantly, choose an exercise plan that you enjoy doing. For me, I play tennis. So if I get on a tennis court, what about this? I'll be hitting the ball. We'll, we'll serve, zero, zero. We'll finish the match. So by the time we finish, I would have had a game. Okay, if it's table tennis, you want to play or any other form of sport, it is good exercise for you. All right. Then the next one is weight control. Weight control. So in this picture, we see the various forms of weight. And how would you know whether you are underweight, you are normal weight, you are overweight, or you are obese? And a simple way is what we, we call the BMI, okay, the body mass index. And this is a function of your weight against your height. So it means that the shorter you are, the lighter you should be, right? I just saw a familiar face. The shorter you are, the lighter you should be, okay? The taller you are, the bigger you, you can be. You understand? Uh-huh. So, um, and it's calculated as your weight over your height squared. Okay, your weight over your height squared. Um, the weight should be in kilograms. Your height should be in meters. So if you're, you calculate your BMI and you are getting 18.5, it means you are underweight. If you get between... 18.5 and 24.9, you are normal weight. Me, I'm normal weight. Okay, if you are between 25 and 29.9, you are overweight. And then anything between 30 and 39.9 is obesity. And then over 40, you are morbidly obese. Morbid obesity means that you are at risk of all the kind of cardiovascular problems that you can think of, like hypertension, diabetes, stroke, heart attack, okay? So a lot of things can happen to you, which, which will not be good. So if you know someone who is like this, please, when you go home, tell him that he should. <laughs> All right. And anything beyond overweight, too, is not good. So you need to work, work on it to reduce weight. And beyond this, another thing is, has to do with your, uh, what you call trunkal obesity. So our midsection, your tummy. If you put on tie, and your tie rolls over like this, you know that you are in trouble. Do you understand? Uh -huh. You know that you are in trouble, so you need to burn, to, to burn it. All right, L let's go on. And then the other W is water, or water intake. We say that water is life. Our body is made up of more than 90% water, meaning that the cells in our body, the blood that runs through our bodies and all that, a great chunk of it is water. So if you don't drink enough water, you are depriving your body of essential fluid in which the body lives. And how do you know whether you are taking enough water or not? Generally, we say that your, your water intake per day should be a minimum of three liters. And this is what the white people have written in their books, by the way. <laughs> and they are not in tropical areas like us. So in this day and age where there's a lot of heat, we are sweating. Sometimes you may walk several distance and sweat a lot. It means that we should be doing more than three liters of water in a day. And I've seen all of you having water in front of you. As I'm talking, some people have started drinking water, <laughs> which is good. So with the bottled water you have, it's 500 mils. So in a day, you should drink not less than six of that in a day. And the good thing is that when you drink water, there can never be water overload or water abuse. Okay, when you drink, it's good. And how you can also tell whether you are drinking enough water or not has to do with the color of your urine. If you go to take a leak and then your urine is as plain as the, the like behind, the, or man is not plain. So if it's as plain as uh, white, then you know that you are taking enough water. But if you go and pee and it has a shade of this or a shade of my brother's dress, <laughs> It means that you are not drinking enough water. It means you need to drink a lot of water. And when you deprive your body of water, what you're also doing is that you are starving a very important organ in the body called the kidneys. The kidneys work like filters. You know how when you are preparing palm nut soup, you put the methane, methane, I don't know, the, the <laughs> in, a, in a sieve, 
and then you pour water on it. Okay, the more water you pour, the lighter the fluid that comes out. That's how the kidney works. So if the kidney can function well, it's dependent on how much water you are taking. So that if the kidney is not getting enough water, the kidney will starve. And the next time, instead of drinking water, which will cost you like, if it's sachet water, maybe 30 pesos, now you are going to spend about $150 on dialysis. So water is important. Another good thing about water is that people who drink water, when they are aging, their skin still looks nice. Mm? It helps with hydration of the skin. If you are not drinking enough water, your skin will be um, wrinkling. You'll be getting wrinkles often. So you need to drink water to stay, stay healthy. All right. And then people will ask, I'm sure some people will ask, doctor, should we drink cold water, warm water, room temperature water, or hot water? Water is water. Okay? There is nothing like There's been several theories. I'm sure when you Google, you'll find it. Some people will say, when you drink too much cold water, it will burn your chest. Me, I like cold water. I drink cold water. Aha. Uh -huh. If you drink room temperature water because it, it conforms with your body, temperature is good for you. If you do that, if you can do that, you can enjoy it. Fine. And then also, water therapy. Um, I used to have very bad migraines. And um, somebody advised me that one, one thing that can help with migraine was water therapy. And for him, what he was doing was that when he wakes up in the morning, he wouldn't brush his teeth. And then he would drink 500 mils of water, sometimes even one liter of water. And he told me to try it. One day, I didn't brush my teeth and I drank water. I almost vomited. So <laughs> I told, since then, I'd rather brush my teeth before I drink. So once again, there is no hard and fast rule about things. Do you understand? The most important thing is that you are drinking water, and you are, the water is clean, it's wholesome, it is not um, dirty water, it's from the right source. Once you drink it, you should be fine. All right. Okay, so we move on to C, which is caffeine. And I know some people love caffeine. They love coffee. Like when they see this cup of coffee, they are already craving for it. Let's keep in mind that caffeine is a drug. It's a stimulant. And it's recommended that if you take up to 400 milligrams of caffeine, it's safe for a day. Okay, how would you know it's 400 milligrams? For every, and they come in different brands. So different brands of coffee or caffeine have the strength that it has. So before you prepare any coffee to drink, check the strength of it. So, and calculate and see whether you are within 400 milligrams. Anything beyond 600 milligrams, you are causing trouble for yourself. Because when you drink a lot of um, caffeine, it can cause restlessness. And I remember in Presec, um, Ibo was mentioning that me, I used not to sleep. And he was worse. <laughs> when we were in Presec, one day I decided that an exam was coming up. I was going to drink coffee to stay awake. And I made the coffee thick because I wanted it to work. And then I drank it. Hey, at a point I wanted to sleep. I couldn't sleep. And you know what was happening to me? My ears were now making noise. Quing, quing. <laughs> and I became restless. My hands started shaking. I started sweating. So that's what excessive uh, um, caffeine intake can, can cause. And it's also addictive. So some people can get hooked on to caffeine such that they can't stop. It can cause tummy acid. Sometimes the time you want to sleep, you can't sleep. And it can also cause headaches as well as hypertension. So when you are, you are pregnant, you should avoid caffeine. If you, are, you already have sleep disorders, you find it difficult sleeping, don't go for caffeine at all. If you already have high blood pressure, which you are struggling to control, caffeine is not good for you. Sometimes caffeine even will cause palpitations. Your heart will be beating, ting, 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 ting. You go and check and you say you have arrhythmias. Okay? If you already have anxiety or mood disorders, you now tihuana ubo brim brim. Okay, don't go and take caffeine, it will worsen it. And we may have to refer you to a psychiatrist. So just keep in mind, uh, coffee has its place. It can be served, it can be taken as recreational drug. Sometimes I take coffee, I put a lot of milk in it, and then I take it to work. That serves as my breakfast. So once you are within limit, it's safe. But when you have all these other conditions, please avoid caffeine entirely, okay? Avoid it, all right. Put down your questions, so let them come when we get there. All right, then the next one is alcohol. And for, no, hold on, hold on. And for alcohol, um, there are several debates. Depending on the doctor you talk to, 
Doctors who drink alcohol, they will tell you, Charlie, hey, <laughs> For some of us who don't drink alcohol, when you come to me, I'll tell you, don't drink alcohol. There, there is no hard and fast rule about it. If you check the literature for alcohol, they say limit alcohol intake. Limit alcohol intake. By in limiting alcohol intake, the other thing we shouldn't forget is that some of the things that we take already have alcohol in them. Our body on its own has some level of alcohol. Like the kinky we eat, the granules we chew, some of the cough mixtures that um, we, we drink, some medications already contain alcohol. So your, our body gets the alcohol in it already. So if you're taking a lot of alcohol, you're already adding on to what your body has. Okay, so even though there are no hard and fast rule about whether you should take alcohol or not, I, for one, would always advise you to stay away because alcohol, and I make reference to Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21 will define this for us. And in the um, contemporary English version, it says that it isn't smart to get drunk. Drinking makes a fool of you and leads to fights. And then the NIV version says, wine is a mocker and beer a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is not wise. So if you tend to like alcohol so much that for you, eh, they are, you have to take alcohol before you can eat, or you, can take, you have to take alcohol even before you can function, then it means that Solomon is telling you that and how you can easily get there because if you use too much of it, it becomes addictive. You begin to enjoy it. Boys' boys will sit, and boys' boys have to drink. Okay? And also bear in mind that alcohol also affects the liver. Okay? And we see so many people who come to the hospital with liver cirrhosis or liver cancer because of years of bruising and damaging their liver. Okay? What they do is that they drink, ah, and then their, their liver gets beaten. The good thing about the liver and the kidney is that God created them such that they are able to regenerate. Mm? No matter the injury to them, at a point they're able to regenerate. So if you come and then you have a liver disease because of alcohol, it means that you didn't allow the liver to rest. You were beating it so much that at a point he gave up. And that's how come you've developed the liver disease. So if you can avoid it, it's better, and especially if you're in a family where maybe you had a father, an uncle, there are people who have alcohol issues, you know that you are at risk. So don't go and taste it, crowd, for you to fall into that family, family line. All right, let's go on. Then the S, smoking. For smoking, unlike alcohol, all the literature will tell you that no smoking. If you are smoking, you should quit. If you don't smoke, don't try it. If you've smoked and you stopped, don't go back to it. Do you understand? Because it's been found that once you smoke, the damage of smoking follows you several years down the line. So there have been people who, who have smoked for maybe one year, and then several years down the line, they come with a condition we call chronic obstructive airway disease. Their lungs are not able to... Um, taking enough oxygen, they come in and they are having difficulty breathing and sometimes they have to be on oxygen therapy for a long time. Or it can lead to lung cancer. It's also been found that smoking is associated with almost every cardiovascular disease you can think of. Not almost, actually all the cardiovascular diseases you can think of. Heart attacks, stroke, hypertension, kidney disease, and even the cancers as well. Throat cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer and the like. So for smoking, it's a no-no. You will not see any doctor and say that, oh, smoke once in a while. No. <laughs> smoking is a no-no. And that's why this picture is showing that no smoking. All right. Let's go on. And then E is for medical. The E there is for medical examination. So this is something that I'll dwell on a bit so that we can all get abreast with it. It's important that all of us, at least once a year, you go for medical checkup, comprehensive medical checkup. Because as I told you from that diagram, you never know when disease can hit you. Don't say that I'm too young to have this particular illness or that illness. So once a year, you should do that. And I'm happy that Jackson Educational Complex does that. Um, no, Jackson College of Education does that repeatedly for all his staff. 
and it's free of charge. I thought at this time you'll clap for the management. Because they are committed to excellent health for their staff. Okay, so, and these are the things that you should always check when you come to the hospital or when you report for a checkup. One is to check your blood pressure. Okay, and for blood pressure, making it simple for all of you, your blood pressure should not go above 140 over 90. Your blood pressure should not go above 140 over 90. And you say I said 140 over 90 because blood pressure is reported in a fraction. Some people, when they come and you ask them, oh, when they check your BP, what do they say? They say 130. I say 130, or I say oh, 130. Uh, no. <laughs> so there's the top one and then there's the down one. So you shouldn't go above 140 over 90. And it should also not go below 100 over 60. There are variations in between, but it shouldn't go below 100 over 60. And then it shouldn't go above 140 over 90. Then the other one is blood sugar testing. You should also be checking your blood sugar when you report for regular or routine checkup. Um, if you haven't eaten and we check your sugar, it shouldn't go above 7 millimole per liter. If you haven't eaten and we check your sugar, it shouldn't go above 7 millimole per liter. If you have eaten and we check your sugar, it shouldn't go above 11.1 millimole per liter. I'm taking you to school, right? All right. It shouldn't go above 11.1 millimole per liter. There are other tests now. There are more advanced tests that we use to define diabetes. But for your level, for general knowledge, just keep that. And then you should do a kidney function test. Okay? Do a kidney function test. I see it's once a year. It will help you know how your kidneys are functioning. You should also check your liver, a liver function test. The thing about both the liver and then the kidney is that we can check the functions in your blood and as well as take a scan. So sometimes we can do a liver function test by taking your blood sample, it's normal, or maybe there's abnormality and we say go and take a scan so that we can visualize your kidneys and then your liver to know whether there's a problem happening. And then you should do cancer screening. It's even more important if you have that risk in your family. And for men, 40 years and above, you should always do your prostate. You should screen for your prostate, how your prostate is functioning. And that can be done once a year. It's even more important if in a family, your father, your first cousin, or your uncle, your brother has had prostate cancer before, you should even be checking it earlier. Okay, but at least once a year, we do what we call the PSA or the prostate specific antigen. And then for women, breast and then cervical cancer screenings. For women, you can do self breast examination to determine whether there is any lump in the breast. If you see any change, report so that um, if there is a problem, it can be picked up quickly. Cervical cancer is also very important for any woman who is of reproductive age, sexually active. We can do pap smear to determine whether you are developing any abnormality along the cervix. And if you have, you have problems like intermenstrual bleeding or um, after you've reached menopause, you see blood, please don't keep it to yourself. Immediately report to a hospital, see a gynecologist, let them screen you for cervical cancer. Or sometimes it may even be a cancer in the womb, endometrial cancer. If you pick it early, there can be a solution. And then one thing I should say quickly is that the good news is that currently, medical practice has advanced so much that every disease condition has a treatment. Okay? Every disease condition has a treatment. I didn't say has a cure, but has a treatment. Okay? Meaning that if you pick it early, we can give you medications to prevent it from progressing or getting worse. So it's all about being able to pick it early. If you pick it early, we can always give you medication or give, provide some intervention, even for cancers, if it's not advanced. Now, there are several modes of treatment where cancers are bent and then people go into remission and they never even show any symptoms, okay? So it's very important. And then for the various blood test, you can say that you want to do a full blood count where you're able to determine your HB level, whether your hemoglobin levels are dropping or not. Your cholesterol level is also important because as your cholesterol levels go up, you are at risk of stroke, heart attack, kidney disease. Um, uric acid levels can also cause gout. 
So we should also check your uric acid levels. And then we should also be screened for hepatitis. That way, it doesn't matter your age. You have to test for hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Because when you are negative for hepatitis B, we can give you vaccine for it. Even when you are positive, we can do further tests to determine whether you need treatment or not. Because both hepatitis B and hepatitis C can lead to liver cancer. And that's what we want to avoid. And then finally, what do you see there? HIV. For people who are sexually active, you also need to be doing routine HIV tests. Don't be scared. Now, HIV is not scary, okay? I think people are more afraid of COVID than HIV. Or people are still afraid of HIV. Yes, okay. <laughs> yeah, but trust me, for most people, once we detect that you have HIV, we pick it early, there is treatment for it. And there are so many people walking around who have HIV and are on treatment, and you can never tell. Because usually, within six months of adhering to therapy, people with HIV look well. So now, those days where you used to see people with HIV looking very thin and emaciated, now it's, it's no longer there. So don't be afraid. Mm? Come, let's, let's test you. All right, okay. All right, so keep your questions. We'll come to the question time. Then the next one is stress. And I remember when Daniel contacted me, we were battling, okay, should we do physical health, mental health? So I know that mental health is a very important part. And so I'll, I'll spend some time to talk about stress and stress management. And I always say that stress is a state of mind. And in actual fact, when I search, that's the definition of stress. It says that a state of mental or emotional strain or tension. Okay? It's, it's something of the mind. So if it's in the mind, what do you do? You can block it. You can deal with it in your mind. You can deal with it by not allowing yourself to be under that stress. Okay? So what are some of the sources of stress? The sources of stress. Yeah, one, one source is poor management of resources. I always say that some people get themselves into stressful moments, okay? If you don't manage your resources, mainly money, if you don't have money, you'll be under stress, right? And some people, they go through that money source of stress because they are not managing their financial resources well. So they see someone with iPhone 13, they also want to buy iPhone 13. Or they've told themselves that any new iPhone that comes, they will buy it. So that in that year, whether they have the money or not, they want to go and buy it. Or they start working, they earn some small salary, and they want to buy a car. And the car they want to buy is an SUV, where they are buying for like 300 Ghana cities or 500 Ghana cities a week. Okay? So if you don't manage your financial resources well, when the month is up and then the banks are delaying, then you are angry. Like, <laughs> you, you get any alert on your phone, you check to see whether it's a bank alert. If it's not a bank alert, then you do... Uh, <laughs> uh, because you've not been able to manage your finances well. And I'm sure that um, Jill has had uh, brought people who can talk to you more about financial management than I can. But then I know that with one of the things that they tell you about financial management is that if you can't live six months continuously without your salary, then you are in trouble. So if you don't have enough resources to last you six months without salary, then every month you'll be under stress, right? Mm -hmm. So make sure you have enough, put in enough. And then the other component is time, time management. So why are you under stress in the morning, rushing out of the house so that you will not be late? Because you didn't manage your time, the time you slept. If you woke up in the morning, you haven't programmed yourself such that you, you, you have timed yourself what time it will take for you to bath, maybe iron, get ready, and then leave the house. So you are running late, and there is stress on you. Let me give you a typical example. So someone can call you, and then you pick the phone. Hello? How are you? I'm fine. I've been trying to call you. I'm not getting you. I called you last week. Oh. Did you see my call? <laughs> Oh, yes, please. I saw the call, but I was busy. Okay. Nana, how are you? How is work? Work is fine. Are you still at tech hospital? Yes, I'm still at tech hospital. Hey, then you've been there for a long time. Oh. <laughs> how are your kids? How is your wife? She's fine. And the kids, they are fine. How many kids do you have now? <laughs> I have three. 
have you got a boy? No, they are all girls. So when are you getting a boy? Then you finish saying all the pleasantries. And then just when you think the call is over, they say, ah, no, no. why I called you was that I've not been feeling well. I want to know where you are. When can I see you? But this one can take roughly maybe two minutes or of three, two minutes gone. But assuming this person called and maybe I'm busy and then I drop. So sometimes when I see that you are that kind of person, <laughs> so maybe I drop a message that I can't pick. Kindly send a text. The text is straightforward. Good morning, Nana. I trust that you are well. I've not been feeling well. Where can I meet you for, for you to take care of me? Reading the text message will take me a second or two seconds. I respond, Papa, Papa, I'm, I'm at Tech Hospital from 8 a.m. to maybe 5 p.m. Yeah, yeah. So you can imagine that if you pick these kind of calls, maybe 10 in a day, already your time is gone. Do you understand? So that some things that you need to attend to, you'll not be able to attend to them. There may be deadlines that you need to meet, like for instance, preparing for this presentation, preparing my slides, and I'm picking calls. Then by the time the day is up, I've not even finished my slides. There's a deadline on you. There's a report for you to write. You are not getting them ready. There are lectures for you to give. You have not prepared them. Or you're a student. You are preparing for exam. You haven't managed your time well. And exams is approaching. What will happen? There will be stress on you because you didn't manage your, your time well. Okay? So time really is of essence, and you need to manage it. And energy. Sometimes people use their energy for all sorts of things and at different times. So the time where they need to have energy maybe to work, maybe during the night, um, perhaps you work even on weekend, you work on Saturdays, then you decide that Friday night, whatever it is, you and boys, boys will have to go and hang out. And you go and hang out, maybe you go and club deep into the night. In the morning, your energy will be gone. So if you are at work and you are not functioning, there will be stress on you, right? And then having said that, there's also the unanticipated events that can bring stress on us, like loss of close people. We don't have control. Sometimes you can lose a very close person, and there's stress on you to manage, to organize funerals and all that. That can be a source of stress. And then job loss. COVID time, a lot of people lost their jobs. They had no control. Or sometimes an organization you are working for goes down. They don't have the money. They lay off people. You lose your job. And it's not your control. And then ill health. And that's why we are talking about wholesome health. So that we maintain good health in order that when you are ill, it will not bring stress on you. Because when you are ill and you go through stress, that will also cause further problems on you. And then the last part is self-imposed or psychological. There are some people, no matter how much you encourage them, they are constantly under stress. They say it themselves, maybe I'm stressed. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they've had a very good weekend. On Monday morning, they wake up, I am stressed. Every conversation you, they talk about, they are stressed. Like, the least exposure to anything beyond them, they can't handle it. And a typical example is where some people, they come to the hospital, you run labs for them. I've told you about routine checkup. So such people, they come, you've shown them the labs, so everything is fine. You assure them that, oh, your kidneys are fine. Your liver is fine. Your cholesterol level is fine. Your blood pressure is fine. I said, doctor, are you sure? <laughs> uh, so doctor, are you sure? Are you sure I'm not going to die? Uh, and then they are constantly worried. So sometimes such people, they can walk to the consulting room and they have a file of laboratory test that they've done. They've scanned their brain, they've scanned their chest, they've scanned every part of their body. So in spite of all that assurance that they have, they are still worried. Another source of stress has to do with the contemporary times where there is unhealthy competition. Everybody is trying to put up appearances. There is social media. Some people will go to studio and take nice photos and then they, they splash it on social media. And people are putting on makeups, and we don't see the scars on their faces. And when you see, you see the so many who are forbidden, and all sorts of things. That is putting pressure on ourselves. Some people are having struggles, and yet they put pictures of um, vacations that they've been through and all that. And if you are not there, you also be looking on, and you get stressed because of unhealthy competition. Okay? And then the satisfaction, where you are comparing yourself with others. Mm, that we are looking at, hey, these are people I finished school with. This person I finished school with is now in this place. Where am I? But I've told you the, the, the life cycle. 
everyone and everyone will get his share, right? But if you start worrying about the fact that somebody has achieved this, seemingly achieved this, and you haven't achieved, when, when in fact you should be counting your blessings, then that's where the problem will be. You will feel dissatisfied, and it will bring undue stress upon you. Sometimes some people check themselves. I'm 30, I'm 35. This person is married. I'm not married. The person who is married, do you know the problems he's going through? <laughs> uh, and then uh, this person is married. They have a kid. I don't have a kid. I have one child. They have three children. Why am I having only one child? They have boys. I have girls. Why where am I going to get a boy? So if you think about it, they have hair. I don't have hair. When am I going to grow hair? <laughs> so, so if you think about it, there will always be a point of dissatisfaction. But if you can just take joy in what you have, they know that you are blessed and you not be going through undue stress. So how do we manage or the tips in managing stress? What are some of the tips that we have to be able to manage stress? Next slide. All right. So one is to plan and manage our resources. I've mentioned that once you plan and manage your resources, your money, your time, you not go through stress. And then avoid unhealthy relationships. There are some relationships you realize that the person is always com competing with you. You realize that this person, he never even says anything positive to you. Like he's always bad mouthing you. No matter what you do, you are not going to um, get the person's approval. Or they are pulling you to maybe spend your money unnecessarily or waste your time that's an unhealthy relationship so avoid it if it's out of if the person is out of your life avoid it entirely and then maintain positive social networks keep in mind nobody is an island you cannot live your life where you, you don't have social networks okay you don't have people that you can relate to okay and join positive social networks have a role to play in the church in, at your workplace, if there's a welfare group, when they are going for someone's funeral, go. Go and then support the person. You don't know when also the Ebeba. Do you understand? Or like myself, I'm in my tennis club. The club is something that we all help each other. We, it's a social network where we meet, we play tennis, we have fun together. Okay? Cultivate a good work-life balance. And that, that's something in recent times I've, I've learned to do. Where... Um, initially, sometimes if you are not careful, you close from work and you take work home. And even at home, you will still be working. And on weekends, Sunday, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And yet, <laughs> you are, it's a Sabbath and you are working. Okay? So create a time where you tell yourself that I am not working. The work can wait. Because when you are sick, someone will do the work. Oh. Or if you die, someone will take over the work. So why do you make it seem like the whole work is on your shoulders? Okay, and for me, no matter even how busy I am, I'm never, that time I was telling my best friend, we were having a conversation, I told him that I don't, I've never gone through stress. And I say it to the glory of God. Like, I don't know, like, one day in my life where I can point to and say that I was under stress. Partly because, one, I have a positive outlook towards life. If something is not going well, I look at the positive side. So I will not even look at the negative. Number two, I also make time for everything. I compartmentalize my life. So if my early morning where I want to go and play my tennis, I'm playing my tennis. Even though I'm a doctor and then people need to get me. If you call me, my phone is on silent. I'm sorry. But that's the time for myself. Okay? Or if I'm going to drop my kids in school, it's a time with them. I don't pick calls. Until I drop them, I don't pick anybody's calls. It's not even my father's call. And he knows. So sometimes if he calls me between 6.30 and 7.30 and I don't pick, he knows that I'm dropping the case. Because that's the time with them. They are going to be in school for about eight hours until they come back. That's the early morning where I'm having my time with them. Do you understand? Okay, so there are, there are things that you need to do. You need to define your time. So that if I've had time for them, for instance, I'm having time with my family and then you call me, and then I'm picking a call, and somebody is telling me he has a headache, which has been there for 10 years. How am I going to fix that headache at this time? D do you get me? Uh -huh. So you, you need to be strategic about it. Otherwise, you will not have a very good work-life balance. Make time for it. Okay? And listen to soul-inspiring music. And this one, recently I shared a story about a time in my life where I woke up and I was down and all that, and... 
all of a sudden, I realized that I started singing a song we learned in Sunday school. Jesus loves me, this I know, this the Bible tells me so. I started singing that song, and before long, I sang it till I got out of the house, and then I forgot about everything. Assuming I'd been listening to a song like, please, please give me an example, I can't even think of any. <laughs> What's it? Oh, then. Oh, one person, I me one Oh, one person, I me one Aha, like you wake up, and that's what is playing in your mind. So, even in a very difficult period in your life, that's what will play. You don't have any positive soul inspiring music playing, right? All right, let's go on. And then read good books. Read good books. Books, books, bo- books are good. Okay, read, read like your whole life depends on it. Always have something that you are reading. Good books that will feed your mind. Okay, let's go on. Promote and practice accountability. What I mean by this is that, you see, one thing that can bring stress on you is if you are being phony. Like, you you are not upholding integrity or you are not transparent in the things you do. You are not accountable to anyone. The next time, hide and seek. One day you are here, the next time you are here, when they ask you, where are you? You can't even say it. What will then happen is that, what it mm? with, with this group of people, they see you one way. With another group of people, they see you differently. Then when those two come together now, you don't know how to behave. Do you understand? So if you practice accountability, you have people higher than you, whom you look up to, you talk to about your issues. They can guide you. They can tell you that, Nana Kwame, this acquire will fast I will come this way. And I, I love mentorship. There are people above me, like Mrs. Jackson and Prof. If I, they should call me anytime and say, we've heard that you are doing this, stop it. I'll stop it immediately. There are people that I look up to. There are people at my level that I also share a lot of things with. I have a best friend that is a very good person. So if I, I'm having issues, I can discuss with him. And he can check on me. He can tell me that, no, this is not what you should do. And I have people also look below me who look up to me as their mentors. So in that case, in things that I do, I tell myself that I cannot fail them, okay? So when you practice um, and then promote accountability in the things you do, you will not be stressed because there are people you can relate to who can guide you and you can also give inspiration to. And then once again, you've seen the exercise. When you exercise, it relaxes you. You're able to overcome stress. Let's go on. And then develop resilience. My brothers and sisters, my mothers and fathers, as I've said all this, life is not so straightforward. Sometimes you can do things, like you're observing the the rules of driving, and then some reckless driver can just come and hit you. Or sometimes you are doing the right thing and some unnecessary thing can happen in your life. The question is that, will you be able to stand? So that's where the resilience is. So that no matter the struggle you go through, you should be able to toughen yourself to be able to stand setbacks and overcome them. So that no setback will make you say that I've given up. I want to kill myself. Life is not worth living. Hey, you want to live this life? <laughs> uh, life is always le- worth living. Uh, you know, what we can all do is develop healthy sleeping habits. Healthy sleeping habits. Sleep is one of the most beautiful things God created. Eh? And for me, when, when I sleep, I'm rejuvenated. And by God's grace, I don't have problems with sleep. Even right now, if I decide to sit here and sleep, meta. Okay? (laughs) And that's a blessing. So, you should take advantage of it. But how can you develop healthy sleeping habits? Shall we look at them? One is that you should always go to bed. Don't fall asleep. One of the tips is that go to bed. Don't fall asleep. What does that mean? For some people... They don't have a sleeping time. So they are watching TV, and then they will sleep in the couch. And then if they should wake up at 3 a.m., fine. If they should wake up at 5 a.m., fine. It's like they didn't plan to go to bed. Okay? So their sleep is disturbed. But have a time where you say, it's time for me to go to bed. You've showered. you change into a very comfortable clothes. Some people, they sleep in their work clothes. How can you sleep well? So even when you wake up in the morning, you feel tired already. Mm? Get up. Go and lie in your bed. Okay? Turn off the lights. Turn off everything so that you can have a good night's sleep. And I used to have a very bad habit of, okay, I get home. Because I'm blessed with sleeping at any time, 
Maybe I get home around 7 p.m. I'm tired. Then I want to take a nap. I take a nap from maybe 7 till 9 p.m. And then I work from 9 p.m. till about 2 a.m. And then I go to bed again. And then I sleep till about 5.30 or 5 a.m. And then I get up and then I go to work. The following day, I come, maybe I'm not tired. Then I work on my laptop till like 12 midnight. Then I go to bed. Then I wake up around 4 a.m. And then I work. If I'm feeling sleepy after one hour, I go and sleep again. So I wake up feeling not well rested. So in recent times, for about a year now, what I do is that if I get home, and I'm tired. I just sit, I relax. The latest time I go to bed is about midnight. Okay? So if by 11 or by 12 midnight I go to bed, then I sleep throughout till 5, 5.30 or 6, whichever time that I'm okay. So my minimum of five hours continuous sleep, I get it. And it's continuous. So when I wake up in the morning, I feel refreshed. And that's what we should all do. Okay? That's all we should all do. Um, and there was a study that showed that people who sleep less than five hours every day for five years reduce their life expectancy by five years. So, <laughs> so if you sleep less than five hours a day continuously for five years, you are reducing your life expectancy by five years. So if you're supposed to live to 70, you reduce it up to 65 years. Okay, so plan... Plan to go to bed. Make sure you sleep adequately. And then be consistent. I've mentioned that. Have a regular sleeping pattern and schedule. And then create a relaxing sleep environment. Some people, when you enter their bedrooms, they are, there's a heap of clothes on the bed. There, there are books on the side. There's this here, this here. So when he's going to sleep, he gets there and then he pushes this outside and then he will sleep. So the whole place is cluttered. Or in their room, they are sleeping and the radio is on. So he's listening to radio, ah, then he'll fall asleep. And sometimes around 3 a.m., maybe someone will be shouting on the radio and then to wake him up. <laughs> or he'll sleep in, the TV is on, the lights are on. And it's been found that when you are exposed to screen, screens do not allow you to have a good sleep. So if you are in your room, you turn off the lights, the TV is on, and you are falling asleep with the TV on, you wake up and you'll be tired. So turn off everything, remove all the distractions, Make sure the place is relaxing. Let your bedroom be a place when you enter. You feel good. Change your bed sheets. Don't let it smell. <laughs> All right. Okay. Avoid, avoid sedatives and then stimulants. Okay. Avoid taking sleeping tablets unless it's prescribed. And there are times when people come to me and you realize they are, they are struggling with sleep. I'll just give you medication to help you sleep for about three days, four days. And you try and find your own rhythm. And then also don't take coffee four hours before your bedtime. That's the recommendation. So avoid stimulants. Avoid drinking stuff that will keep you awake because that will also disturb your sleep. Okay? All right. And then be active during the day. Sometimes retirees, when they come and they tell me that they can't sleep, I look at them and like, so umbre. Like <laughs> people who are retired or on pension, they are sitting at home. Sometimes even they'll be napping. They'll be sitting there and then they'll sleep a while. And then they come. Sometimes their relatives will come and say, oh, doc, yeah, man, I mean, on, on that crowd. Then when you ask them specific questions, you realize that they even sleep more than you do. Uh, so be active during the day. If you are active in terms of the work you do, in terms of physical exercise, when you exercise and your body gets tired, you'll be able to have a good night's sleep. Okay? All right. Let's go on. And then I conclude with spirituality, the last S, which is the God factor, okay? Um, we as humans, we can do all we can. And it's not, it's not bad for you to do what you can. Don't say that, mijame nyame, okay? Because God also relies on you to have a sense of responsibility. So that all that we've talked about, you should be able to do them yourself. And go on. But it's been found that there are people, um, actually people who come to us and are sick, and who have faith in God or have a source of faith. It may be Christianity, it may be Islam, it may be whatever religion. For people who have a source of faith, they tend to do better health-wise than people who have lost faith or don't have faith in God. I've seen people who we thought were going to die, they were sick, and then through their faith, they got up and they got well, and you asked me that, how did they survive? And I don't have an answer. <laughs> do you understand? And then there are people who also 
They don't have any money to go and do regular checkup. They don't have a doctor to take care of them. They don't have access to good living and all the things I've talked about. But God keeps them because they, they know whom they've trusted. So I make reference to Isaiah 26, 3, which says that you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So once we keep our trust in God and our minds are stayed on him, he keeps our minds in perfect peace so that there will be no stress or fear of worry. And then finally, I also have this, that beloved, I pray that in every way you may prosper and enjoy good health as your soul also prospers. Meaning that in the Bible there's wholesome health, right? The wholesome health we are talking about, God himself inspired John to write this, that we will we'll we'll prosper in every way, in every aspect of our lives, and be in good health, even as our soul prospers. So this one, we're looking at the body, mind, and then what? The spirit. All right. I'll conclude right now with this. Just to remind you of what we've talked about once again, going back to what I mentioned, that for every human being, we're born to die. The common fate of every man is this. We'll go through this cycle. But the question is that whether when you die we remember you or not depends on what you did between the time you were born and the time you died. And also whether in old age you will enjoy good health or your illness will come at 50 than 70 years or 80 depends on the things that I've shared with you to be able to achieve wholesome health. So just recapping the new cases that I shared with you. Let's look at that the tips for healthy living or wholesome living, yes, N for nutrition, E for exercise, W for weight control, water intake, S for smoking, no, C for caffeine, sorry, A for alcohol, S for smoking, E for examination, and then S for stress, sleep, and spirituality. Thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you. Come on, put your hands together for him. Put your hands together for him. Ladies and gentlemen, this was a wholesome presentation. Put your hands together for him one more time. So you realize that when we started, um, we had a couple of expectations and then we brought up our expectation. I don't know about you, but personally, I feel that every expectation I had has been meted out. I don't know about you, but if whatever you expected, the questions you even put in your questionnaire, if one of your questions were answered, please just give me a wave. That's amazing. So now we are going to enter into the next session. Very, very important. This is where you get to ask your questions. Everything that he told us, everything that he taught us this afternoon, I'm going to give you the opportunity. Please get the microphone going around. We are going to ask our questions, um, the questions that will be coming from here. And some of them are also going to be addressed, the ones you sent to us when you were filling the Google Forms. We're also going to take questions from those who are also following us online. You are all part of this one meeting so I'll be taking my questions so if you have a question you just um, give me a wave and then the microphone will walk to your side then you can ask your question and our doctor will address your question so let's do that quickly let's take our first question please okay so can we take the microphone to my extreme left Please, I want to know the cause of a prostate cancer. That's amazing. Right. You want to Thank know you. the causes of prostate cancer. cancer. Thank you. Okay, please, we take the next question. We're taking the questions in batches, then we, we go on with it. Okay, good afternoon. My name is uh, Vincent. Uh, I want to ask about, there's this uh, feeling you have once in a while, you realize that all of a sudden you are extremely hungry, you begin to, I don't know if that's what you call hypoglycemia. Yes, I want to know what really causes that and what is the immediate remedy to it. Because sometimes, the last time I felt like that, I wanted to eat almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> and all that. So I want to know if do you have to just eat in moderation or drink something or whatever. And what really causes that? Thank you. All right. Uh, okay. Thank you. I'll take the first two and then we'll take others. 
Okay, all right. Thank you. Um, so for prostate cancer, in terms of the course, like every other cancer, we don't really have a definite course. Um, what we rather have are risk factors for getting prostate cancer. So one is that, first of all of us should keep in mind that once you're a male, you have a prostate. Okay, prostates are found in males. They are not in females. And um, it's also been found that everyone as you grow, your prostate will grow bigger. Okay? Um, for some, it will grow bigger earlier than others. The, the risk for developing prostate cancer has to do with age. So it's been found that most people 40 years and above are at risk of prostate cancer. For cancer specifically, they are at risk of prostate cancer. And then number two, for those who have a family history of cancer, and that's what I mentioned, maybe your father, a brother, a first cousin, male, an uncle had a prostate cancer, you are at risk also of, also of, of also having prostate cancer. So it means that we need to check that for you. Um, there's been several things, and I'm sure you may have heard it before. Some will talk about sexual habits. Um, some will, there are some publications that show that for men who had a lot of sexual activity early and have been having a lot of sexual activities are more at risk of prostate cancer than others. That has been proven by another literature that also shows that men who do not have a lot of sexual exposure tend to have prostate cancer. And I want to clarify that myth. So it's a myth. It's not true. Okay? It's not true about sexual activity, whether more sex or less sex puts you at risk of prostate cancer. It's not true. But the main thing has to do with your age, the family history of prostate cancer. Those are the main risk factors for development. And if there's any history of cancer at all in your family, it puts you at risk. As well as habits like... Um, smoking that I talked about. So if you smoke or somebody has been smoking, that person is at risk of prostate cancer. Is that okay? I hope I've answered your question. Yes. But then, in terms of the growth of the prostate, as I said, everybody's prostate will grow. But when it grows, it can be normal growth of the prostate, which is called benign prostatic hyperplasia, normal growth of the prostate, or it's prostate cancer. And the upper limit of your PSC, the prostate specific antigen, if you go and do any test, is four. So if you do it and it's more than four, it's important that we investigate further. If it's more than four, it could be that you have an infection which has affected the prostate, or it's the BPH which is occurring, or it's cancer. But all that has to be investigated to be sure of what we are dealing with. Then, um, is it Vincent? Yeah, yeah Vincent asked about... Um, sometimes getting hungry often. So hunger is also a sensation from the mind, though. <laughs> so sometimes um, you can feel hungry because your body is craving for food or your mind is craving for food and your body responds to it. Um, and sometimes if you allow some time, you realize that the hunger will go away by itself. That's why you're able, even able to fast the whole day. So you start fasting in the morning, you feel that, hey, listen, I can't do it. But you realize that when you dismiss the thought, you're able to fast till 6 p.m. and you even want to go beyond it because your body has gotten used to it. But having said that, if you feel hungry and it just hunger pangs in your tummy, it's not really serious. But if it comes with maybe lightheadedness, dizziness, sweating, your hands are, ch are shaking, you start feeling um, having blurred vision, that one, get something to eat immediately. Whatever you can grab. Anything containing sugar. Hey, I'm sorry, not whatever you can grab. Anything <laughs> containing sugar, drink it immediately, okay, to replace what you have. If it happens repeatedly, report to a hospital for us to assess you because there is a, a tumor in the body that can also produce a lot of insulin. And insulin is what brings down your sugar. So if there is a tumor in your body producing a lot of the insulin, your sugar can come there, and we need to check to see whether you are having um, such a thing. Other than that, I mean, if it's just a one-off thing, then you shouldn't worry. You should also check your eating habit, um, making sure that you are eating small bits frequently and not allowing yourself to go hungry too much. 
All right. Any question? Okay, I'm Cynthia Chabwatin. Please, I want to find out, can I take anything for breakfast? And my second question is, what causes the high and the low pressure? Very good. Um, can you take anything for breakfast? It's a no. <laughs> Aha, this one is a tempting question, anything. It can't be anything for breakfast. Um, so it's often said that eat breakfast like a king. So your breakfast should be rich as much as possible. Uh -huh. And also, it should be defined by your level of physical activity. If you are going to do a lot of work during the day, moving about, up and down, make sure that at least you get something good, something heavy to eat. I know people who eat fufu in the morning. If you eat fufu in the morning and the evening, maybe take a, a slice of sandwich, fine. Uh -huh. But if you are going to eat fufu in the morning, if you come and eat banku, then it's like for you, you are just eating heavy throughout the day. So your breakfast should be rich, it should be heavy, it should be able to something that balance, exactly. Something balanced that can sustain you throughout the day. For hypertension, it's good you really ask this question. Hypertension, once again, has to do with one lifestyle. Okay, so when you become obese, people who are big are at risk of hypertension. If you have a family history of hypertension, once again, family history, it puts you at risk of hypertension. When you are aging, your blood pressure is likely to go up, so we need to check. Stress, mental issues, emotional issues can cause your blood pressure to go up. And then, particularly, one thing I didn't mention is salt. Mm, salt intake in China. Okay, salt intake can also cause your sugar to, uh, your blood pressure to go up. Particularly, when you add table salt, some people, when you put food by their side, if they don't put salt in it, they can't eat the food they have been, they've been served. So to, to prevent that temptation, make sure you don't have salt on your dining table. Put it away. Whatever is prepared for you, eat what, whatever salt is in the, is in the soup, okay? Uh -huh. So that, that, those are the main causes. But of course, we also have secondary causes of hypertension or high blood pressure. Once again, if you're a young person and we find that your BP has gone up, the doctor would want to investigate to see whether there are underlying problems that may have led to the high blood pressure. I hope I've answered your question. The low blood pressure, okay. So low blood pressure, some people generally have low blood pressure. I'm one of them. My BPs are usually, mommy, <laughs> my BPs are something around 95, 60, 95, 55. And I inherited it from my father. So once again, it's a, it's a family history. Number two also has to do with people who are physically active. So people who, are, who do a lot of exercise like myself, our BPs tend to be lower, our pulse tends to be lower. If the, it remains persistently low and we don't identify that, maybe it's a family thing, maybe you have a normal BP of around 120, 70, and all of a sudden it has dropped. We want to check to see whether your body has lost fluid. If your lo body loses fluid, your blood pressure can come down. So people who may be having diarrhea, if you're having profuse diarrhea, passing a lot of um, stool with water, or you are vomiting, that can bring your BP down. So if it happens like that, we have to get you into hospital and then give you um, um, IV fluids to bring your BP up. I don't know why you are laughing, but I also laugh. <laughs> 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 Uh -huh. <laughs> to, 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 bring, to bring your BP up, okay? Uh -huh. And people who are bleeding, when you bleed a lot too, your BP can come down. Or sometimes if you are on blood pressure medications, if you're on blood pressure medications, your BP can come down and we can decide that, okay, because your blood pressure has come down, we are no longer going to give you the medications. All right. Okay. My name is Evelyn Moferi. Uh, my question is... Uh, concerning oxygen, can lack of quality oxygen cause heart diseases? And if so, what can you do to attain quality oxygen in a day? Thank yeah. you. Okay. Um, qu quality oxygen, I, I look at it in two ways. It's, it's about the, the, how purified the oxygen is, how, the, how clear the air is, the environment, yes. Yeah. So polluted environment definitely can lead to lung disease, mainly lung diseases. But some of the lung diseases, if they go on for a long time, they can lead to heart diseases. So you should make sure that your environment, the air is purified, 
um, avoid congested areas. So it, 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 sometimes you can have a small room where about five people are lying in. They wake up in the morning. They don't open the windows for air ventilation and all that. That can also affect your lungs. And then with quality of air, I'm also thinking about the volume, how much of it you take. So it's also advised that you do breathing exercises, okay? Have time where you're taking deep breath in, out, in, out. And oftentimes you get that if you exercise. So when you exercise and you are panting and you are breathing and you are taking in air, what you are doing is that you are exercising the lungs. And the lungs should become healthy and it also prevents you from developing heart diseases. Is that okay? All right. Okay, good afternoon, say. I yeah. am Glenda. Please, my question is, there's this um, thing they, they say, Anansi uh Achemenai. -huh. What are the causes of those things? And then number two, what is also the cause for hepatitis B and C? The cause for hepatitis B and C, okay. So Anansi, we call it numbness, or tingling sensation, or um, paresthesia. That's the name we have for it. A number of things can cause it. One is if there's, there's no free blood flow to the part of the body, whether it's the hand or the leg. So sometimes, depending on whether you sat down for a long time or you've, you've laid on your arm. So some people, they sleep and then they feel that their arms get stiff because, because there's no free blood flow. So that can cause that. Number two, it can also be deficiency in some vitamins. So vitamin six, vitamin B, vitamin B6, and vitamin B12. Those are some of the essential vitamins that you need. So some people, if they have that, they have deficiency in vitamin B6 and vitamin B12, they can feel numbness in their, in their legs. So we need to check to see whether that's what is causing it. Um, the other thing also has to do with conditions like diabetes. Um, people who have diabetes also tend to have what you call neuropathy. They are nerves. So apart from the blood or the vessel, there are also nerves. In tree, we say in tini. In tini is for nerve, it's for vessel, it's for artery, it's for everything. <laughs> but nerves is in tini. So um, sometimes when you have diabetes or even hypertension and some conditions, the nerves get affected. And so because the nerves are affected, it can cause those tingling sensations. So once again, once sometimes if it occurs short period, some people, as you are seated and then you're leg or your hand become them and then you shake it off it goes away it's not a problem it's when it becomes persistent that you need to report to a hospital for us to check whether it's diabetes that is causing it or um something like deficiency in the vitamins that are causing it good and then for hepatitis b and hepatitis c they are considered sexually transmitted infections but um when somebody has hepatitis b the commonest mode of transmission is from mother to child so unlike hepatitis C, hepatitis C has the highest mode of transmission being sexual route. And it's often common in uh, men who have sex with men or people with sex, multiple sexual partners. But for hepatitis B, I'm saying it here so that if you know someone who has hepatitis B, you don't go and say that you, they say that you are promiscuous or your life is not good. Uh -huh. A lot of people who have it do not have it from sexual route. So there are people who are married um, one person is her B positive, the other is her B negative. They've had children, and the partner never got infected because the sexual route is very minimal. It's less than 5%. So people can have hepatitis B and be married and will never infect their partners. Okay, so sexual route is one. Another thing has to do with blood transfusion. So if blood is infected and with her B and hepatitis C and you are giving the blood, you can get it. Sharing of sharp objects. So needle, blaze, um, and all that. If someone has had it before and gets infected and you use it on yourself, you'll get it. One thing I should all disabuse all of you, your minds of is that hepatitis B cannot be transmitted through sweat or saliva or by touching someone and all that. Sometimes they say that, hey, when you have hepatitis B, I can't get close to you. If sexual root cannot even transmit it, sweat and saliva cannot transmit it either. Okay, so um, these are the general... Um, causes, but from mother to child. So if a woman comes to us and she's hepatitis B positive, we, we take it seriously because then you have to check her viral load, make sure that when she's pregnant, if the viral load is high, we give medication to bring it down so that the child does not get it. Or when the mother delivers, 
until she's given, um, until the child is given a vaccine and then an immunoglobulin, an injection, the mother is not allowed to breastfeed the child so that it will not be transmitted to the child, okay? Because the mother-to-child transmission carries the highest risk of hepatitis B. Once again, once you've asked, let me also indicate to you that hepatitis B is not curable, but there's treatment for it. Hepatitis C is curable. So when you have hepatitis C, we can cure you of hepatitis C. For hepatitis B, when you get it, and then we test you when you need treatment, the treatment is for life, but the treatment does not cure the hepatitis B. Is that okay? Another difference also is that hepatitis B has a vaccine. So if you are negative for hepatitis B, go and get a vaccine so that you don't get it. But hepatitis C does not have a vaccine. And, and that's why when you get infected, there's treatment for it. There's a cure f for the hepatitis C. Okay. All right. Hope that's helpful. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, my name is Prince Ayimboatin. And my question is um, referring to the sleeping habit. All right. So I, I intend to sleep very well when I play um, a hymnal jazz or a soul music. I sleep very well. Um, doesn't mean I'm really um, using or not doing, having a good sleeping habit. If I don't play anything, I just sleep like that. I don't sleep or I wake up and I feel like I'm tired or something. Okay, yeah. all right. So it means that for you, this is the, the environment you've created for yourself to be able to have good sleep. So if, and if it's cool, soothing music in the background, that will help you sleep. It's not a problem. It's just that maybe you've done it over time, so that's what you are, you've adopted. Just bear in mind, I see that you're a young man. If you get married and your wife doesn't like it, and you have to sleep, then that's where, <laughs> that, that's where the adjustment and then the, the negotiations have to come in. So make sure that if you grab someone, you start introducing her to the music before you get married. Uh -huh. All right. Okay, but it's okay. It's healthy. There's nothing wrong with it. Once it's, it's helping you to be able to sleep soundly, that's fine. All right. Okay. Anything? Good afternoon, sir. I'm Dennis Mensa. Um, with exercising, I know some people run a lot. Okay, but after running, is it good for the person to take in very cold water? What relation does it have with the heartbeat? Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a trick question. Uh -huh. It's the same thing. It's because of what I do. So me, when I finish playing tennis, I like to drink cold water <laughs> because my body is tired and it's refreshing for me. So I'll drink cold water. I've read and I've seen people, I've heard people say that because you've exercised, your body is heated up and going to take cold water will cool the body down. Um, I cannot prove or disprove it. Um, it makes sense with that theory that if you finish exercising, take water that is in line with your body temperature. If you take it and you are okay with it, fine. There's nothing wrong with it. If you finish and then you want your cold water, I have been doing that. It, it doesn't cause me any harm, but it refreshes me and I'm still able to feel good and sometimes even exercise more. So it all depends on what works for you, but there is, there is no proof of it having any adverse effect on your heart or your body. But it makes sense that it's going to cool down your body. It's like, what do your body need through heat? And now you are bringing it down rapidly. It's somebody's theory. It's yet to be proven. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you, Doc, okay. um, for an, an excellent presentation. So my question is about our food, our diet. So I wanted to find out, and um, there are a lot of theories about you shouldn't eat a lot of meat and all those things. And I've also heard that people are saying that, oh, did you have a number so I just want to find out your thoughts on it. I mean, if I buy my fufu, then I should just buy one cow meat and one salmon, or I should, you know, I should share my enemies to my food. <laughs> yeah, very, very good. M mommy, you have something to say. Please go ahead. Mommy, you want to talk? Okay, all right. Um, so meat, meat, red meat is not good. That one has been established. Uh, I'm here to change, but it's not good. Uh -huh. It's not good. I'm going to change. Actually, I told my family that when I turned 40, when, when I turn 40, I'm only going to eat meat again. I'm yet, I'm, I'm, I'm yet to fulfill that, that vow. Um, meat is not good. I particularly red meat, goat, beef, and all that. If you can stop it early, it will do you a lot of good. People who, are, who don't eat meat at all, they tend to live long. They tend to live healthy. 
because red meat has been found to be associated with some cancers, like colorectal cancer. Okay, colorectal cancer. So if you can stop it, it, it it's the best. The best kind of um, meat in coat you should be eating is um, fish. Okay, the fish, if you can get dry fish, it's, it's good. Amane and, and all that. Those, those are good. And sometimes you can even get fish that taste like meat. If, if it's, you still want to have the taste of meat, if you get very good fish, maybe um, um, cassava fish and some kind of fish. What kind of other fish? I heard someone mention catfish and all that. And if you can develop that, f fish is always the best. Okay? Yeah. And as much as possible. Y yeah, pork too. It's been found that they actually the... The, the oil, the, the pork oil has also been researched to be found to be healthy. But, yes. <laughs> but but, but the, best, the best form of meat, as I said, is, is fish. Okay, so go for fish. All right, mommy. Uh. Uh, okay, doctor. When I lived at KNUSD campus, I could name about six or more people who died when they were showering, taking their bath. What could have been the cause of that? Great. They were taking their bath, Great. and they never came. When they went to check, they had died in the, in the bathtub. bathroom. Uh -huh. Amazing, yes. yes. Uh, we, we hear that. Uh, uh, actually, um, sudden death, the commonest cause of sudden death is heart attack or myocardial infection, as we say. Um, that, that is usually the cause of sudden death. Most of the time, when people die suddenly, it's usually because they had a heart attack. And for such people, they may have had high blood pressure without checking. And then, or maybe they, they had diabetes and all that without checking, and then, boom, it happens suddenly. Other times, too, it could also be that they had a stroke. And the type of stroke that can also kill suddenly has to do with the bleed. The one that you get and you bleed in your head that when it happens, usually um, they, it, it kills almost immediately. Or by the time they find you, you're already dead, especially the massive type of for stroke. So what I think could be the cause may be a heart attack or a stroke. Or once again, if the person has diabetes. The other thing I didn't talk about is that the blood sugar, too, if it goes down, it can kill. So hypoglycemia, usually below 3, can kill suddenly as compared to the sugar going up. So sometimes we even advise that when your sugar is up, we are happier to control it to bring it down than if it's down. Because if it's down, it's difficult to, to bring it up. So sometimes if someone goes into hypoglycemia, maybe he has diabetes, took his medication or insulin and did not eat, that can also cause sudden death. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, talking about sleep, um, I know he said again and again that uh, we need about uh, six to eight hours of sleep. Yeah. Um, where you cannot have that length of Sometimes. sleep, yeah. uh, what happens? Because you, you go to bed, let's say after midnight, and uh, before five, you've woken up about twice to go to the washroom. So by the time you get up finally, you wouldn't have had three hours continuous <laughs> sleep. <laughs> now, what happens? Very good. Very good question. So it's also recommended to take naps if you can afford it. Uh -huh. um, for young people who have to go to work and all that, usually it's difficult. But if you're on pension and you're at home or you're on break, sometimes you can take a nap. And I do power nap to when I get the opportunity. Power nap is sometimes 20, 30 minutes in the afternoon. I can put my head down, sleep, wake up, and I'm refreshed. Uh -huh. So it's advisable also to nap, to make up for the deficit. And also even getting up to go and urinate and come back, it also depends on the wakefulness or the wakeful period when you wake up. Some people, they just go and urinate, they come and hit the bed, and then they go back to sleep. So that's not considered an interrupted sleep. But some when they wake up, they go and pee and they come back. They struggle to sleep again. Then try and make up for um, by taking a nap during the day. All right. Hope I've answered your question. Good. Okay, Doc. Um, 
I have a couple of questions here I want to bring. Um, someone wants to know um, what is the major cause of cervix cancer and how it can be prevented from women. And then I also have a question here. Someone also wants to know what will be the major cause of kidney failure and kidney cancer. So let's deal with these two. All right, so cervical cancer, I think I mentioned in my presentation, usually um, it's got to do with sexual activity. It's a risk factor, it's one risk factor. So um, early sexual encounter puts you at risk of cervical cancer because one um, organism that has been associated with cervical cancer is what we call the human papilloma virus, HPV. So, and it's also gotten through sexual encounter. So when you are exposed to sexual encounters and you get HPV, you are at risk of developing cervical cancer. Having said that, it's also the risk also has to do with age. So a lot of times people also get cervical cancer later in life, especially if they were sexually active in the time when um, they could have children. But the major thing that you should always not take for granted, as I mentioned, is if you have post-menopausal bleeding. You reach menopause and you see blood. It's a red sign. Go to the hospital immediately for us to check you. Another thing that we can do routinely is what we call the pap smear, where you report to the gynecologist or the, um, some of the hospitals. They take um, samples from the cervix. They take to the lab so that if there is any change occurring, they can pick it early. Is that okay? Uh-huh. Then the, the second question was? Kidney, kidney failure Ki and kidney, kidney cancer. Kidney failure, okay. So kidney disease, um, a number of things can cause kidney disease. Usually kidney failure is a layman's, uh, but you can have kidney disease. One is hypertension. So if you have hypertension and the hypertension is not very well controlled, it can lead to kidney disease. Number two is diabetes. People who have diabetes also develop kidney disease. Even high cholesterol levels, if you have high cholesterol levels and they are not controlled, what they do is that the cholesterol will block the blood vessels supplying the kidneys. And that can lead to, <coughs> sorry, that can lead to kidney disease. For kidney cancer, it's not common. And actually, the commonest uh, kidney tumors, we call them kidney tumors, are not malignant, they are not cancerous. There's something you call renal cell carcinoma. They are curable, like you can take it out and then the person will recover. Once again, it's not something you'll be able to identify by yourself that you have it unless you report to the hospital. Maybe we take a scan and we do a kidney function test. Yeah. Um, the other question I want to ask, um, is there a condition where a fallopian tube can be blocked? And when um, it is blocked, can it be unblocked? There's a question coming in from someone. All right. Okay, by the way, my disclaimer is that I'm not a gynecologist obstetrician. So some of the things I share with you are things that I know at my level as a family physician. Um, there may be advances in some areas that I may not have knowledge of. But the fallopian tube can be blocked in various ways. One, it can get blocked intentionally. So um, people who have had their kids can decide that they want to go and do bilateral tubal ligation where they tie their tubes so that they don't have children again. Usually that is considered permanent um, contraception, okay? Where, and it's only rare that somebody would have fallopian tube tied and for it to fail. So usually when you have BTL, it is permanent um, contraception. So in that case, you can't go and then untie it. But if it's blocked as a result of um, sometimes infections, so some people will get what we call maybe sexually transmitted infections over time, or they get pelvic inflammatory diseases, the, the tubes get blocked. So sometimes they do colonoscopy to look in and then see what they can do. Or, or sometimes just by treatment, putting them on antibiotics to treat the infection, get the, the tube to be Patent. But it always depends on the extent to which it is blocked. And one of the things that we do in the hospital to determine whether it's blocked is to take you to the scan room and then they pass a dye. 
and it will illustrate to see how it is blocked. Some is not totally blocked, then it means that you can have your children. If it's blocked and one side you can have a child, I mean, it's patent, then the air can go through that side. But when it's totally blocked, usually they advise that you do in vitro fertilization or um, assisted delivery or assisted uh, pregnancy. I will ask a question about stomach ulcer and then we will continue with the questions from our audience here. And um, one or two questions, then we'll bring the meeting to a close. Um, if someone has not gone to the hospital yet to be diagnosed of uh, stomach ulcer, what are some of the signs and symptoms that the person know that are with the asameyen and stomach ulcer? Let me go to the hospital. So the symptoms are usually you get pains in your, your people say stomach, but we say abdomen. So abdomen is the whole place. So some people, when they say abdomen, they think abdomen is only the lower part. Uh -huh. But the abdomen is your stomach, what we call stomach. Uh -huh. So maybe for your purpose, I would say that when you have pain in, around the side, the upper abdomen, okay, the upper abdomen, it could be a sign of um, peptic ulcer or what we call gastritis, or the left side of your abdomen because the stomach goes around that place. So if you get pains around that pl those areas, it may be that you may be developing peptic ulcer, even though the other organs that are there is one thing. But typically, those pains are usually associated with meals. So someone will say that when I'm hungry, then the pain gets worse. Or when I'm hungry, then I feel the pain in those areas. Or after eating, immediately after eating, as soon as I finish eating, the pain comes. And sometimes they are associated with particular kind of medications, like the pain medications. Like if I take this pain medication, I, I don't get a comfort at all. I start feeling severe pain. So when you experience such symptoms, you should talk to your doctor. And the only way we can confirm you have peptic ulcer is for you to do endoscopy. And sometimes some people, when you mention endoscopy, then they, they get scared. They say, yeah, I would do. But if you don't do it, we cannot tell. And especially when you are advanced in age, it may not just be peptic ulcer. It may be a tumor. It may be stomach cancer that you are developing. But if you do it and you pick it early, we can help you deal with it. So endoscopy is always very helpful to be done if you are getting those symptoms, to be sure that it's either peptic ulcer you are dealing with or it's a malignancy or a cancer that you are dealing with. That's amazing. We'll take um, one final question from the audience, and they will be rounding up. So um, I see um, that young lady, this side. Yeah, the woman with the glasses, yes, that woman. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. I've noticed that we have a lot of childhood obesity. I wanted you to throw a bit of light on it. Like, what can a parent do if their child is like way overweight? The the sad comment I heard recently: a mother said, "Me who me Yes, is that bad? So I wanted you to speak a bit on that. Excellent. Thank you. All right, maybe let me, t let me talk about that now. And Franca, thank you. I'm sure you have a few thoughts to share yourself. Um, th that's another thing that is creeping in, childhood obesity. Um, because of the lifestyle that we've adopted now, our children are eating all sorts of food, and we are happy when they are eating. Sometimes they will eat and we are happy. Did you mommy, did you mommy, and they are happy, okay? And the children are also not getting time to play. Like when we were kids where you can go out and play P-Lolo. How many of you played P-Lolo? Uh -huh. You run, do P-Lolo, you do Cresciada Franca, you wear a distance and you run. Uh, mommy, you say, uh -huh. you put cloth at your back and you run for it. Too. All those things are not being done now because we become protective of the children. We fear that even when they go out to play, they will, they will get hurt and then we are putting them in cars from home to school. And sometimes their schools don't even have playground for them to play. On weekends, they're in the house watching TV. They, they're eating be behind the TV. And then even someone has to pick their food to go and put in the sink for them when they finish eating. So we are, we are not making them active. And by that, that's how we are got, have getting this um, childhood obesity. And it's a, it's a serious problem. Because if the child develops obesity early, 
it just puts them at risk of hypertension, diabetes, stroke, earlier. So they won't get to the end of the cycle I showed you. It means that we are going to have more children now, unfortunately, God forbid, going to be dying at age 40 and 50 because they've developed obesity. So we should be careful. We should now also be mindful of the portions of food we are giving to our children. We shouldn't be so happy when they are eating and humming and and the next moment they go to the fridge, they take food and all that. We should start by now looking at the portions of food they eat um, and then make it commensurate with the with their level of activity. And sometimes seek professional help. Now there are people who are into this. They are dietitians, they are nutritionists. When you realize that your child is becoming too big, take them to the dietitian or nutritionist for them to look at it. And beyond that, having said that too, childhood obesity can be an illness on its own. Sometimes child, some children are growing fat or big, not necessarily because they are eating a lot, but because they have some, we call, what some call endocrine disorders. So if you have a child who is so big, sometimes you mean when they come, like Franka is saying, that person needs to be seen by, and now there, there's a specialist who is a um, pediatric endocrinologist. They can check, and there are, are children who are developing diabetes now. And when you're a child and you develop diabetes, it means you have to be on insulin. A child does not take diabetes medication. And if they start taking insulin, if you are not careful, They'll be on insulin for the rest of their lives. And we all know the complications associated with it. So it's very serious that we should all take um, note of the kind of thing that we are giving them, the ice creams and the chocolates and all those things. Uh, yeah, Indomie. Uh, uh, Indomie is a brand, though. <laughs> I'm sorry. So the, the, um, all those junkies that they are eating, the pizzas and all that, they are, they are not helping. Them. Let me eat some of our local food. A pim some do some contumery, grind it for them, mm, let them eat vegetables. And the other thing we should also um, dis discourage our children from doing is where they become selective. That sometimes you have a menu for the house, and then one child will say, me, 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 I don't eat ampeci. And sometimes because we want to pamper them, I want to eat um, fried rice, and we want to prepare fried rice for them. We should encourage them to eat what is available. And realize that when you do that, with time, all of them will fall in line, and they will not be making choices as to what mipewe, mipewe, that kind of thing. It's not good. All right, so thank you very much for the question. Yeah. All right, anyone else? Uh, hello, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I know some of the information that we imbibe in us has a major um, effect on us, and I wanted to ask, uh, with this influx of information on the internet, when it comes to these medical theories and myths, uh, can you help us with maybe websites, anywhere we can get, you know, quality information? Uh, so, to because some of them, some people are religiously practicing some of these things, and it's wrong. Yeah. So, um, can you help us with that? Yeah, you're right. Um, hmm. So, as to which website and all that, I mean, you have to always test the the credibility of the website. Look at who are the people behind it. Are they people with, with the right expertise, the right background? And then also look at, if you are into reading publications, they are also very helpful. And um, once again, even with the publications, look at the source. Are they people of, from reputable institutions who have come up with those publications? And then um, even on radio, there's a lot that is being bombarded on us, our radio stations, um, and all that. So, unfortunately, you, you have to test the information you get. And it's very good you are talking about. If it's beyond you, what you can do is talk to your doctor about it. If you find something that you don't understand, check with your doctor. Let the doctor also um, confirm or refute whatever you find. Very good. Um, hello. Uh, please, my question. Um, I want you to help us debunk a myth that I've heard. Um, eating a lot of food from microwaves, um, how does it affect our health? And also, I'm this particular person, I like to eat my food very hot. Even Fanti Kinke, I don't mind microwaving before I eat. Um, does it affect my health? Mm -hmm. And the last thing is um, the effects that we have, um, um, herbal medicines have on our, 
our health generally. Maybe you are going through something, then somebody will advise, no we no no we no. Like, how does it affect our health? Thank you. V very good. Um, so, in terms of hot meals, hot meals are good. It's good to eat hot because if it's hot, then you are killing, as you said, you are killing the germs in it. It's good to eat hot food. Now, about microwave, yes, microwaves are. They radiate things. So, of course, there are people who say that microwave foods are not healthy. If you can um, do it over fire, it's the best. So if you also have the means and you, are, you have the time to get it fresh from the pot, it's even the best. Then they prepare for you right from the pot, you eat it. But unfortunately, in this day and age, because of the work we are doing, sometimes you have to put the food in the fridge and then microwave. If you can do it on, on, on the fire, it's the best, because that one, you'll be able to um, heat it well. Microwave has its challenges, but um, so if you can do, the best approach will be to do it on fire. If you can't, and once in a while you want to microwave, it, it's not a problem. Then the herbal preparation. So herbal preparation has its place in medical care. Um, a lot of the drugs that we are taking, the orthodox medicine, some of them were prepared from herbal sources. Now the question is, how well have we in Ghana developed our herbal medicine to be able to compete with the outside world? And KNUST is training herbal physicians. And we have accredited institutions like Mampoe Kwapim where they do herbal medicine. If the source can be authenticated and you can be sure that this thing is something that has been purified and certified to be good. It's okay to use it, but the problem is about the, the lapses in our system where regulation becomes a problem and all that. So once again, test the source and be sure that it's good. But one thing I've always said is that if it's a herbal preparation that you are doing at home, so like Moringa, Moringa became in vogue. We know about its medicinal properties and all that. If you yourself, you have boiled it or maybe you've cut it into, you've washed it thoroughly, you've cut it into like vegetables and you eat it, is it from your own house? Do you understand? Or um, like even the, the, the fever flower, or how do they call it? The, um, is it? Uh -huh, there are several of them. I mean, some of them have their own medicinal properties. So if you, have, you know the source, you gathered it and you've prepared it yourself and you are taking it, there is no problem with it. The problem I have is where the, they make a claim as if the herbal medication cures all diseases, like the panacea to all diseases. Then that, that, that one, you should have a problem. And also, when you are taking the medication, you don't even know the dosage. <laughs> uh -huh. And it's like, oh, they're no, no, grand, grand, grand. It's like they give, you, they give you a whole gallon for you to keep drinking, 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 for you to get finished. Then you know that you are killing yourself. Because some of the herbal medications have, have also been found to destroy the kidney. We talked about the kidney. They can destroy the kidney. They can destroy the liver. Particularly the things that they sell outside where we don't even know the source. What they do is that they mix it with orthodox medicine. And sometimes if you are not careful, you go and take a medication that you don't need. So th th those are my thoughts that I'll share with you on um, herbal, herbal medicine. All right. But I'll just add something quickly that I remembered I didn't share with you in terms of the stress management. That also has to do with meditation. It can be a controversial matter. Some people will say meditation. When they hear meditation, they think that you are being spiritual. Uh -huh, you are going into some occultic thing and all that. No. So it's recommended that at least a minimum of 10 minutes during, in a day, just sit down and relax. You can close your eyes and don't think of anything. Just relax, okay? Ten minutes of inactivity. It's also something good that you can practice to keep yourself whole. Do you understand? So that you don't get into the habit of just running around, running around, and going through problems and stress without making time where you are having ten minutes of absolute relaxation, okay? And in meditating, too, you are meditating on positive stuff. You are meditating on the word of God. You are meditating on even things that I've shared with you, things that would grow your mind and then keep you in peace. All right. Thank you very much. That's all. Right. Thank you very much, Doc.
please put your hands together for him. In fact, like I rightly said, this, is, this has been an amazing program. And I know that next time, whenever we call for a jail leadership convo, you are going to be present. You are also going to be online to follow us live. Ladies and gentlemen, without much ado, I'm going to call upon Mrs. Theodosia Jackson to give us a closer remarks. Put your hands together for her. Indeed, the saying goes, he who knows not and knows not, he knows not. It's a child, and that person must be taught. This afternoon, I found myself to be a child, and I have been taught. Who is here who didn't gain any knowledge? Let me see you. All of us, he has spoken to us. Midnight free calls. <laughs> we will advise ourselves. Those of us who don't eat breakfast, lunch, and eat double-weighted fufu at 8 p.m., we should be careful. We have learned a lot, and I know we are going to change. I have decided I'm going to change, and you should also change. One thing is, the exercise, some of us with knee problems and so on. But one time he said, you can dance. Yes. You, on your own. You see, some of you, when you go to church, you don't dance. You don't clap. You know clapping is a therapy. You don't clap. Especially those who are getting to apostlehood and deacons and deaconess. They don't want to clap. And they leave the clapping for the others. But all these are part of exercise that we can do. So if you cannot even walk for 30 minutes, at least in your bathroom, you can do some exercise by dancing. Let us all take a clue from what we have heard this afternoon. If I should ask some of you to describe how the delivery had gone on. What would you say? Very outstanding. Excellent. Uh -huh. Wholesome. <laughs> Fantastic. Cocastic. Uh -huh. Mortastic. <laughs> All of the things. Uh -huh. What else? Insightful. Again, excellent. Doctor, you are unique. Indeed, we are very proud of you. Oh, do it better, do it better, do it better. Indeed. You are very knowledgeable. Look at how he was eloquently rattling, and even the questions you just brought in, the way and manner he answered them. Let's give him another clap. And he has given us a delivery for more than two hours. He deserves another clap. <laughs> Indeed, we are very grateful to you. And this is not going to be the second time. Please get prepared. As for health issues, we need the solutions. We need to learn. We need to advise ourselves. So I don't know what the pro director is planning, but I'm advising him for health issues, you should be planning to come along quickly. Uh -huh. Yes. And those of us who are about to get married and so on, they are, they are all health issues. It will come in. OK. It's not only people in this room who have benefited. We are grateful to Presbyterian Television who broadcasted life, and it goes all over the country. I know people in Chiriponi, far in Upper East, all of them. So as we are here, we are not the only beneficiaries of 
what doctor has taught us. So doctor, may the almighty God expand your horizon, grant you good health. Whatever your endeavors, your achievement, we are praying that God will do a special thing in a special way in your life. The rest of you who also came and those who listened and watched outside, you are also part of the family. We are very much grateful to all of you. God richly bless you. Thank you. You can do better. You can do better. You can do better. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are bringing the meeting to a close. And I want to remind you that we will be taking um, um, some few photo shoots right from here. So when we are done, please don't go home. Just um, the multimedia team, they are going to direct us, going to go up um, be just right behind the conference room. And we are going to take uh, pictures. Ladies and gentlemen, shall we welcome um, the director for Jackson Educational Complex, Professor Ebenezer Jackson, to say a word of prayer, benediction, and bring the meeting to a close. We thank the good Lord for bringing us here and listening to wholesome health and how to achieve that. Not eating banku and fufu morning, afternoon, evening. Dabi. So we thank the good Lord for making it possible for our brother, Dr. Nana Aisi. Thank God. And I know that we have sat for about two hours. So kindly let's stand as we pray. Heavenly Father, we are very grateful to you for making it possible for us to meet here and to listen to this great talk on our health. It's our prayer that we will learn and practice what we've heard, so that in a year's time, we'll see an improvement in our health. Father, even as we live here and go back to our places, we pray that you will take us safely back home and then continue with the week, good work you have given us. We thank you, and we know that you've done this for us because we've prayed in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Shall we share the grace? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Surely his goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. God bless. So please, we can socialize with one another. And let's move to behind us. Behind the auditorium, we are taking, we are taking a picture. So let's do that quickly.